The Chemex and the Mocha Pot are arguably two of the most recognized brewing apparatus in the world. But nowadays in specialty coffee, the Chemex tends to be used more as a flower pot than a brewer, and the Mocha Pot kind of just a piece of decoration. But what's interesting is if you consider the history of both of these and how they influenced coffee culture as well as coffee consumption in the home. Now this would be a really cool conversation to have if we had someone qualified to talk about it. It'd be really neat if we had like a, I don't know, a PhD candidate in sociology that would, who the, what the? <gasps> Noah Berger is here! Hi Lance. This is Noah, a PhD candidate in sociology. Hello. Today we're gonna talk about the chemics and the mocha pot. Perfect. <laughs> so today we have a really exciting video. We're gonna take a look at the history of the Chemex and the Mocha Pot and how they shaped essentially coffee going forward, both for the US, Italy, and the world. And we've got the brilliant Noah Berger here to discuss it. She actually has a really unique history when it comes to academics. She studied specialty coffee, both in Brazil and in France, and the sociology of them. Before we continue, I'm gonna tell you that the links for her social media are just down below. Give her a follow to check out all the cool work she puts out. She does way more than just Chemex and Mocha Pot, does lectures at Rico and at different expos. and Coffee and capitalism, coffee and milk, umami. If you enjoy what you're watching, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe. Really helps the channel, but anyway, let's go on. Would you give us a brief history of the creation as well as the patent time and just the things surrounding the, uh, the creation of both of these machines? Sure. So maybe let's start with the mocha pot, yeah. which comes to us from Italy, of, of course. course. So the mocha pot in large part has to do with the war and with fascism. Interesting. It was first patented in 1933 by Bialetti, but it really has to do with like the specificities of Italian history and mm. the war and the rise of, of fascism. Yeah. So the fascist regime um, rises around the 1920s, 1926, mm -hmm. 1929, depends when you start really counting. And they're using a lot of different materials for war supplies. Of course. Now, specifically, aluminum, mm -hmm. which the mocha pot is made out of, is this resource that's actually really available in Italy. It's okay. very hard to import and to get different supplies into Italy. Yeah. So when Bialetti invents this mocha pot, which is kind of a way to bring the espresso into the house as well, mm -hmm. um, it represents like futurism and innovation, which is something the fascist regime is very interested in. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's very easy, it's very simple, it's very beautiful and very light. And yeah. because it's made out of aluminum, the regime is very, very happy to promote and leverage and support this. Because it's Italian-based. Yeah, right? it's Italian-based. It's an Italian-based resource. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't need to be imported. Italy at the time is experiencing a lot of difficulty mm -hmm. importing things. Actually, coffee consumption goes down during the fascist regime. Interesting. Right? People are thinking that they're drinking a lot of coffee. They're reporting that they are. But in fact, they're drinking chicory. Chicory. Roasted chicory. Coffee. We know this in the U.S. down in Louisiana. Yeah. A lot of chicory roasted coffees. There is an inflated number of coffee drinkers when in reality the majority was actually chicory and that's due to a stoppage on Mussolini's part to be importing a lot of coffees. Professor Jonathan Morris tells us that actually uh, Italy is having trouble importing a lot of things and coffee is considered to be an imported luxury good. Of course. So they only serve espresso, for example, in hotels for mm -hmm. tourists. So they're drinking less coffee, but at the same time, coffee culture is being mobilized by the regime to kind of show the outside world that Italy is a big empire of innovation of and of culture. So the mocha pot is part of those things. They also reinvent the term barman mm -hmm. and translate it to barista. barista. To make it more Italianized. Yeah, to nationalize the uh, coffee culture. The majority of people are arguably brewing chicory mm -hmm. and not coffee. Part of me wonders if like the push for this and the adoption of it had anything to do with giving off this, um, I don't know, this facade of intellectualism since, you know, coffee houses since the 1700s have been known as places where intellects would gather and discuss yeah. thoughts and where culture kind of started. So do you have any thoughts from your your specific perspective on 
on that in general. Yeah, I think uh, the mocha pot was purposely like portrayed as a symbol for imperialism and for the mm. grand door of Italian culture. Uh, Diana Garvin talks a little bit about that time during Italian history where Italy was really looking fascist. Italy was really looking to brand itself as mm -hmm. this sort of like new ancient Rome. Oh, you true. You know, the, the glorious Roman Empire that's mm -hmm. very innovative. It has all these inventions, but it's also very classical, you know, deco-y. And I think <laughs> this this mocha pot was a symbol of both the classicism, but also of modernism, futurism. And this was also a very convenient time to invest in coffee symbolism because mm -hmm. Italy in 19, I think it was 1935, had invaded Ethiopia, the mm. origin of coffee, and they definitely used that for like publicizing and talking about coffee. Even though yeah. most of the coffee wasn't actually arriving from Ethiopia. It was of course. getting from, well, at first it was chicory and then it was coffee from Brazil. Okay. But I think that imagery is what they really liked and used with the mocha pot. So the name mocha pot actually comes from the city and the port of mocha oh, in Yemen. Sense. So again, this play on origins, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fascist Italy trying to show up. Again, it was Bialetti, it was not the government that gave the name, sure. but it's like this spirit or idea of trying to show the origins, the, mm -hmm. back to the origins of coffee. So I don't know what's the actual relation between the mocha pot in Yemen, but it's just sending back to that idea. I'm curious how they attempted advertising and, and the Bialetti and, how, and what was the kind of shift to make it as prominent as it is today? We know about the history of uh, mocha advertising is that there was a shift again after the economic boom in the 1950s, like after the war, mm -hmm. when Bialetti's son Renato mm -hmm. took over. And he actually made uh, these advertisements with this little man that was actually the caricature of Bialetti himself. <laughs> like this little man, round man with a mustache. Yeah, situate this in a historical context. You have yeah. the first patent on the espresso machine by Moriando in the late 1800s. Then you have the steam pressure units that are coming out. You have the Victoria Arduino and you have the La Pavoni, which are steam pressure espresso machines. Obviously, those are massive hunks of metal that are not possible to use at home. And so you don't really have much coffee making at home that is in the style of steam made espresso. Of course, the first nine bar machine didn't come out till 1952 by Gaja. But in the meantime, in 1933, the mocha pot, which is steam driven pressure through a puck of coffee, came out in 1933, making at least this style of beverage accessible to people at home using simple heating elements and ground coffee inside of a basket. Of course, it's not the espresso we have come to learn and love, but it was much closer to the espresso served at cafes at that time, since they weren't brewing with anything more than steam pressure, except for the Cremonese screw group, which wouldn't come out for a few years later anyway. This was made of aluminum, mm -hmm. uh, which in the US during the war, that was something that could not be used to create things, right? Because they were using that for wartime equipment. Yes, exactly. Which leads, leads us to the history of the Chemex. Yes. Because the Chemex it has a very similar history, but kind of the other way around. Because mm -hmm. in the US, aluminum and other supplies like steel were and used- Chromium, yeah. Yeah, chromium were used for war purposes. Yep. So they were looking for stuff that they could use for all kinds of domestic appliances, mm -hmm. including coffee makers. Mm -hmm. And this uh, thing, the beautiful thing, the chemist was invented actually by a German guy oh, nice. that immigrated to the United States in 19... 19 35. Oh, wow. His name was Peter Schlumbum mm -hmm. and he's been working. He was a chemist. He patented like over 300 inventions. Wow. And then obviously a chemist, you know, the Chemex, he invented this obviously beautiful, chemist. yeah. yeah he invented this. I think he started working on it around 1929. Okay. Um, but it was only patented in 19, uh, 41. 41. Yeah. In 1941. And the Americans loved this because again, it doesn't use anything that needs to be used for war supplies. Yeah. This is glass, glassware. And it also has this aesthetic that really fitted with what Americans were looking for. Of course. Yeah, I like Bauhaus aesthetic, something that's very simple, and very sleek, beautiful, yeah. very designed, very sleek. So it really, really fitted that imagery that the United States wanted to leverage. And we could maybe speculate that the fact that um, Schlumbum was uh, German mm -hmm. was really nice for them as well during the war. Oh, of course. And then in the 1940s, this really, really took off off as a, as a prominent design object. Mm. It was featured on the cover of MoMA magazine wow. as a useful object in uh, wartime. It became super iconic as both a design object. We don't actually know how consumed it was, but both the Chemex and the Mocha Pot were beautiful objects that were very simple to operate. And think about it after the war as well, it's when they take off mm -hmm. because 
people go back home, soldiers go back home from the war, yep. and women are kind of persuaded to go back to their house and pick up, like, pick back up the domestic Oh, yeah, so like the Rosie the tasks. Riveter thing kind of ended, yeah. people are going back home. Yeah, so they come up with all these appliances and marketing campaigns to make, like, I don't know, making coffee, for example, mm -hmm. simpler for housewives. Of course. So these things kind of fit in, like, very aesthetic, very beautiful. I don't know if it's on purpose, but both these appliances have kind of the shape of a woman's mm, body. Interesting, yeah. As well, we don't know if... Sure, 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 sure. But we can just speculate. Well, and that and was then, that was a, a mark of a lot of design back yeah, then. As I was absolutely. referencing earlier, the Gilda was after Rita Hayworth in the movie Gilda. Uh, Jonathan Morris, again, tells us that a lot of the marketing of the post-war coffee industry leaned on, like, insecurities yeah. of women especially, but people in general, that they would ruin their coffee. And coffee oh, was like yeah. a, a doorway to exhibit how good of a host you were. So yeah. if you made coffee well, then you were a good host. This emulated the most popular style of coffee consumption in Italy, which was more concentrated. So that more uh, f kind of faux crema, or it wasn't much crema with the steam pressure, but yeah. you had a more concentrated beverage like the Fuller espresso body. of the time. Yeah. yeah. And then in the US, who used mainly percolation, this first espresso machine didn't come till after, uh, you had more of a, a watery type of filter coffee that was percolated. And so exactly. these kind of emulate what people are looking for and made it uh, not only uh, accessible to the homes, but in a very fashionable aesthetic way. There's now over 300 million sales of the Bialetti I read, uh, which is absurd. Obviously the Chemex is nowhere near that. Both of them became popular, I guess, in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think the mocha pot kind of stayed popular in consumption. Maybe today it's less so, but as you said, again, a lot thanks to Italian migrants, expats who moved yeah. to Australia and the UK and the United States All and brought Italian America. coffee culture with yeah. them. So initially maybe it didn't become like a global symbol, mm -hmm. but at a certain point from the 60s and the 70s as uh, Italian coffee culture was globalized, mm -hmm. then the mocha pot and the espresso culture in general both kind of spread out. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, and I think it's still very much used in, uh, in all of these places, Australia I know as well. Mm -hmm. And the Chemex, we don't have numbers for sales actually, yeah. but it stayed kind of iconic in a way. What's interesting, it at a certain point kind of disappears you mm -hmm. know people didn't really know about the chemex i feel like until the 2010s right something like yeah, that yeah, yeah. but it does appear in media Mm -hmm. You have like uh, guest appearances of Chemexes in France, in Rosemary's Baby, mm -hmm. and in James Bond Ooh. books. Bond. James yeah. Bond. So it stays iconic, but kind of in the background mm -hmm. until it's kind of taken out of like the, I don't know, oblivion. Yeah. We don't know who is responsible for kind of... Uh, probably James Hoffman. <laughs> probably Let's James Hoffman. Let's just be real. <laughs> <laughs> probably. He made a video about the Chemex a few years back that... I guess, help tell people the story, but yeah. we don't know. Maybe it was competitions, maybe it was a specific coffee shop. You sure. don't really have the single origin of that. It just cropped never. back up kind of out of nowhere. Yeah. It's like it went away after the 50s, 60s, and then just kind of like, I know that in the 60s and 70s, the brand w went through a lot of different owners. So they were constantly changing logos and mm -hmm. things like that, but they kind of rebranded again in the 2010s um, to where they are now. And then they really started pushing strides when they partnered with the SCA and they they sponsored, they were a title sponsor at the 2019 SCA Expo at Boston. It made a sort of a, a reintroduction into the world. Uh, and it's, it's a gateway drug for a lot of specialty coffee drinkers at home. It's a very thick paper, which gives you a completely different experience. So one thing that, uh, is it Schlombaum? Schlumbum. 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 One of the yeah. things he would always say is, this makes it so even a moron could make good coffee. But with the thick papers that he uh, created for, for a very specific purpose, he said, what you want in coffee is two, is two things. You want the volatile aromatic oils and you want the caffeine. And this was back in you know the, the 30s and 40s. He was saying there are 50 chemical compounds in there that are skunky that you don't want in your coffee. And so that thick paper filter helps pull them out. Whereas uh, you know the counterpart here, the only filter is a piece of metal mesh and so uh, you have completely different experiences in the final cup that kind of mark the trajectory of coffee in the US yeah. as well as in Italy whereas one's espresso heavy the other has this you know instant coffee drip coffee mocha master little drip coffee machines that the US is known for watery coffee would you say that this one had a more tangible uh, effect on the preferences of people in Italy, whereas this one may not have had as much of an effect due probably. to the Probably. I mean, the, the Mocha probably had more of a local influence. Yeah. 
But I would speculate that specifically like with the third wave, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the Mocha Pot today is less influential. Like mm-hmm. It's more influential in like homes around the yeah, world, yeah, yeah. obviously in Italy, but also in maybe in the Anglo-Saxon world. I have this I, hypothesis, of course, not founded of why the Chemex was more adopted by the third wave of coffee. I think it mm-hmm. kind of answers more to the ideas, the, the aesthetic ideals that we're looking for, which yeah. is something that is at the same time a little vintage, mm-hmm. right? But is also... Innovative. It's not really innovative, but it makes us think of innovation. Of course. Through chemistry and science yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. like lab equipment. While this originally was about futurism as well, but mm-hmm. when you look at a uh, mocha pot today, it doesn't really feel innovative anymore. Yeah. It's just like vintage, classic, And it's whatever. almost ubiquitous enough that yeah. it's like not new, you know? Yeah, there's not much new about it. Yeah. It Because it caught on, I think, more, it's hard to kind of remake it or, or present it or portray it as innovative yeah. while this was forgotten and it yeah. looks like a chemistry. You kind of feel like you're dis- maybe still people are feeling that they're discovering something, mm-hmm. but of course third wave professionals are dismissing it because it became so popular yeah. as an aesthetic object as well. There are o- obvious downfalls with it, with the chute getting clogged by the paper or it's difficult to have thermal properties when it's borosilicate glass. But what's brilliant is, you know, even back then he purposely made this bead inside the glass in order to tell you when the craft was half full. Uh, and he also had this spout which acted as a double, it was to allow airflow but also to pour from which makes using it uh, a breeze for even novice uh, for novice drinkers or novice brewers novice home breezes novice enthusiasts 1942 is when it was picked up by MoMA and it was also when Macy's uh, the the inventor of this gave Macy's the Macy's buyer one and said go home and make coffee with it uh, and he was enamored and so they began an, a, camp- a campaign immediately in Macy's advertisements talking about how this made coffee so simple that anyone can make it at home prominent figure of people Peter Schlumbum is today kind of put forward as well. This oh, chemist yeah. sitting in the chemistry lab oh, with all of his tools, you know. Mm-hmm. So the inventors in both cases were also kind of used to, I don't know, give more, maybe more life and the personality to oh, both sure. of these products, which is, again, um, parallel to this idea of simplicity, ease mm-hmm. of use, house, housewives as well, playing off the anxieties of housewives, but yeah. also making it super friendly. The little visitor that comes to your house, he's kind of funny, Italian funny guy with a mustache, <laughs> kind of small, short. The little mustachioed you know, man. man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm, mustache, no mustache, sorry. <laughs> oh, yes. Speaking of mustache. Yeah elephant in the room. We'll just breeze right on by that. A lot of people today still use these and still find a lot of joy in using it and it's, it's, that's absolutely fantastic. I know it's fun to play with the Mocha Pot, it's fun to play with the Chemex, and uh, if you want a good recipe on the Chemex, I'll link one right there for you. I made it a couple years ago. But anyway, any final thoughts or any final words or any final uh, observations? Yeah, I think it's just interesting and important. We often talk about like our equipment, why one is better than the other in terms of the brewing, in mm-hmm. terms of like the physical aspects, but we really have to pay, I think we should pay attention to the fact that um, equipment and material carries meaning as mm-hmm. well. And it really shapes like its popularity, our usage of it, and also our taste experience. There is mm-hmm. a lot of research you've cited, some like Fabiana Carvalho on of like course. the impact of color on perception, but it's not just the color, it's not just the material, but it's also the story that comes with True. it. So just deconstructing it can also help us like deconstruct hierarchies as well, yeah. what we think is better and why not. I think it's very, very shaped by the stories we tell about it as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming along and giving us some of your expertise. We really appreciate that. Thank you for having me. Again, check out her uh, Instagram link below and look, check out some of her work. She does some awesome online courses and uh, hopefully we'll be at an expo near you at some point in the future giving a talk on one of her many different areas of expertise. So. See you soon. Absolutely. And I hope that you brew something tasty. Cheers. <laughs>